So we are now recording. Over to you, Cheryl. Oh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, my team uh, is always really happy to talk about this particular topic. So you're in the right place. So I'm going to talk about teaching an accessible online course. And my name is Cheryl Bergstaller. Um, my email address is s-h-e-r-y-l-b at uw.edu. Um, and this uh, presentation is uh, designed particularly for faculty members that don't have a, a, a large, extensive background in IT accessibility, um, or for people that are working with faculty to help them make their courses accessible. Particularly with the pandemic, I've found that we need to keep the story kind of short and show them some simple ways that they can make products accessible. And uh, mm -hmm. then you can fill in the gaps uh, with more technical expertise from our website or future webinars on document accessibility or web accessibility, video accessibility, and so forth. Um, the Accessible Technology Services can, includes two units, <clears throat> the IT Accessibility Team, uh, Terrell manages that group. Um, that ba started back in 1984, it was just merged with other things that I was doing in my group, uh, very small, and then it grew into its own um, unit. Uh, and all of the uh, IT Accessibility Team efforts are funded by the University of Washington. And so our goal is to make sure that IT procured, developed, and used is accessible to our students, our faculty, our staff, and campus vi visitors. Um, but we have another center as part of ATS, which is called the DO-IT Center, where DO-IT stands for Disabilities, Opportunities, Internetworking, and Technology. And uh, this project or program started in 1992, uh, supported with federal, state, corporate, um, and private funds, so those grant funded projects allow us to do a lot more th than we can do uh, just with university funds and stretch out a little bit on, on our uh, activities beyond the UW borders. We even have a program, a do-it center in Japan, the University of Tokyo, and uh, that started in 2007. And there's some other impl Im Im implementations, uh, particularly in Asia. And then we also support the Center on Universal Design and Education, which started in 1999 with the funding by the U.S. Uh, Department of Education. So I'll, get, I'll give you an overview of kind of how we approach things uh, at the university, but also in our uh, in our do it efforts. We have our, a student centered approach um, in what we what we do, and our model is about working with stakeholders like you that contribute to the success of students with disabilities. And so we are uh, have a, as the the hub uh, mm -hmm. success of people with disabilities in higher education and careers. Um, in the case of the ITAT team, it's uh, specifically related to, to technology, but do it is, is more broadly focused. Um, we take a look at who needs to be involved in order to um, level a playing field for people with disabilities. In this case, uh, a university campus or a program, uh, online learning, et cetera. Uh, so certainly uh, the person with a disability is involved. So we work with people with disabilities, um, their family members and allies, peers, near peers, community groups, uh, special programs. Service providers like the Disability Services Office to provide accommodations, uh, K-12 teachers and counselors, post-secondary administrators, faculty and staff, employers, of course, have to be involved, technology vendors, uh, funding sources, uh, and federal agencies and so forth. And so all of our projects in DO-IT are working with one or more of these stakeholder groups, all contributing to the success of people with disabilities. Our two basic approaches is when we're working with uh, students with disabilities, we're helping them develop self-determination skills and knowledge uh, so that they can be successful in this not perfectly accessible world we're all living in. So that's our focus there. And then when we work with faculty or institutions, um, then we're talking about universal design. And I'm gonna mention that as our framework when we look at, at online learning and other aspects of the university experience. So start with what we mean by having an inclusive course. It means that everybody who meets the requirements with or without accommodations is encouraged to participate. Uh, that means when courses are publicized even and they indicate uh, where you can, how you can request accommodation, things like that. Everyone feels welcome. Uh, one of the most unwelcoming thing that students um, are experiencing in uh, many online courses around the country is a syllabus in a, a PDF format that is not accessible uh, to them. I'd say that's a very unwelcoming uh, way to start the, the first day with your students uh, and to treat that as an accommodation. Uh, and the third thing, uh, everyone is fully engaged uh, in accessible and inclusive environments and activities. If we can do all those things, then we've kind of met our goal to uh, make things inclusive. 
want to give a really quick overview of the history and legal basis for accessibility uh, related to online instruction, talk about accommodations, talk about universal design, some principles and examples, and then resources, and then we'll have hopefully a little time for Q&A. So here's the one minute history lesson, lesson of the uh, evolution of responses to human differences, including um, disabilities. Uh, and uh, you know, in some cultures still today, but mostly many years ago, people with disabilities were eliminated or excluded or segregated in some way. So they weren't part of the mainstream population. Uh, in the middle of the last century, there was a movement more toward working with the person with a disability to either cure them of their disability or rehabilitate them in some way or provide an accommodation uh, in an environment. Uh, notice that all three things are focused on the individual with a disability. But now with more current thinking, uh, which is a social justice model or civil rights model, um, then it doesn't make sense to wait until to only work with the student with a disability if they have a right to be in our online classes. Why aren't we making them more accessible to them when they show up? Why should we be surprised by that? Um, and so then the response to social justice, like with other civil rights movements, is in full inclusion. Um, and universal design is just a practice or an approach that uh, helps us get to uh, full inclusion uh, for individuals with disabilities. The legal basis, that's also very short here. Uh, we could talk quite a bit about this, but we won't. Um, some people will say, well, why aren't there any laws about making the uh, uh, courses uh, accessible? Well, there are, there are. Uh, there are two primary federal laws that um, require accessibility. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 um, and the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and its 2008 amendments. <clears throat> you might think, well, you know, those laws, in 1973, there was no internet, no online learning uh, to speak of. And um, well, the, the thing about these laws, they don't talk about specific access, they're civil rights laws. And so they basically say that whatever we're offering at a post-secondary institution, we need to offer it to qualified students with disabilities uh, and make employment accessible to people with disabilities as well. So those are the two federal laws, but um, states, many states like our own have policies. We have policy 188 on IT accessibility, but they most, mostly reiterate these two laws, um, maybe with them some specific uh, guidelines and uh, meeting uh, the requirements. So um, I'm assuming that most people in this group are not directors of disability services or um, people that work specifically with individuals with disabilities. And if that's the case, most, and most faculty members fit into that uh, description, is it's probably best to just think of ability on a continuum. Uh, it, you know, we don't need to know the difference between multiple sclerosis or muscular dystrophy, all these different conditions, but we need to think about people that are in our class uh, might have a wide variety of capabilities. And so if we go from an arrow on the left to not able all the way up to able, um, everyone would fit um, on the line somewhere regarding their ability to do things. And so the ability to understand English or social norms, for instance, some are very able at that um, and some not so much. Could be because of a disability that relates to their uh, social skills. Uh, could be because they were born in a different culture is not related to disability at all. And that's kind of the point here is it doesn't matter why people have different abilities. They just do <clears throat> as a normal part of the um, human condition. Um, and if you go down the list, the same is true of the ability to see <clears throat> or to hear or walk, uh, the ability to read print, write with a pen or a pencil, to communicate verbally, to tune out distraction, to learn and manage physical and mental health. And you might think of some uh, disability categories that would be associated with some of these things, um, like the ability to tune out distraction and attention deficits. Uh, but it's more important to just think about you have a wide variety of, of abilities in any class you're teaching. Uh, another couple of things to think about when you're designing your course is most disabilities are, not, are invisible. Um, and uh, many faculty kind of feel if they don't see anybody in their class, this would be in person, but also online. Um, but if it doesn't look like they have a disability, then they, they don't. Um, and most disabilities are, are invisible, like learning disabilities, uh, attention deficits, uh, autism spectrum, and so forth. And fewer than one third of students with disabilities report them to the disability services office. So even if you don't get a letter from a certain student uh, saying that you need to provide accommodations, uh, you may have a student with a disability that chooses not to disclose to that office. 
uh, because they think maybe they don't need an accommodation and maybe they don't, but maybe they could benefit from them. And they're not disclosing because they're worried that they'll be discriminated against. They've had bad experiences with faculty members or teachers in K-12 that they didn't fully include them in things because they had a disability. So there are various reasons why someone would choose not to register. And it could be simply, uh, they, they know they don't need an accommodation. A student might be missing one arm, but they can't see how they need an accommodation. Nobody's required to register with that office um, unless they uh, need an accommodation. So you might not hear about them or be aware of them. Disability services is primarily offering accommodations to individuals. And this is after an inaccessibility issue is discovered. So it's after the fact. Uh, in other words, not proactive. Um, and we look at our campus and many campuses across the country. And if we look at IT, which we're focused on today, is there are two things that are quite expensive in terms of staff time um, and uh, even paying for outside services as far as accessibility. And so they spend a lot of time on making their inaccessible documents accessible, like the PDF um, issue I was mentioning earlier. And that's mainly reformatting PDF files. And then the, the second one is captioning videos. And we like to remind people that uh, even if they put their videos up on YouTube or use, use some other platform, that there are editing features that they could use to edit those computer generated captions uh, before they use them in their class because computer generated captions uh, may, are likely not accurate enough to um, be an appropriate accommodation for a student who's deaf. Uh, for example, they, you need to get the punctuation in there and spelling right and so forth. Plus, if you have a, uh, you're teaching chemistry or something, you probably have some uh, words in there that uh, the uh, computer didn't figure out quite right. So those are accommodations, um, including extra time on tests and other things that a specific student needs. And you'll find out about that on a letter from the Disability Services Office. But sometimes it's the design of the product or the environment that should be reconsidered. And that's what we're talking about today. How can we design the course proactively uh, so it's more accessible to students with disabilities. And I have a coffee, coffee pot on the screen called the Coffee Pot for Masochists. I've always been fond of this image. Um, it's out of the catalog of unfindable objects, which is out of print, but uh, you can find it in used bookstores. Anyway, it has a spout and handle on the same side. And uh, I think if we took this product, it was a nice design, it's very quite attractive, I think, and gave it to people to serve coffee at a reception, I think you'd get some pushback on that and say, well, why are you making that so hard for me to use it? Um, it you, you might be creative and think, well, you could take the lid off and pour the coffee out the side, or if you happen to be an engineer of some sort, you might put some plastic tubing in and have maybe even a motor, uh, motor to kind of pump things up. Well, that'd be ridiculous. Yeah, well, that's what we're doing sometimes with students with disabilities in our courses. We're erecting barriers because we didn't think enough about um, making them designed in a way that are uh, that, that is easy to use for those students with disabilities or some types of disabilities at least. So we're trying to avoid that by having proactive design. And so that's where we, universal design comes in. Universal design has been defined as the design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. It's a very general definition. Uh, the Center on Universal Design actually created it. And um, it basically says that we'll just, when we're creating anything that's a physical space or a teaching um, opportunity or student service or IT or whatever you're designing, that you think of the broad range of people that might be taking your class or participating in another environment and thinking about them when you do the design and do your best at making things more accessible uh, to those people that you're thinking of. So characteristics of universal design um, are that it's accessible. So technically it, it should be accessible to people with disabilities. And we'll talk a little more about accessibility. Um, and uh, it's usable, which has to do with um, how you can perform functions in that software. So not just looking at some guidelines to make things accessible, but looking at what are the most important things that a person does. And sometimes with a software package, it's the first step in uh, uh, choosing uh, what part of the, the uh, software package you'd like to use that is, is a barrier. And so it doesn't matter how accessible the other things are down the road. And then um, it's also inclusive. And so we tend to have products for the most part, whenever possible, that can be used by uh, people with a wide var variety of disabilities and other characteristics rather than create separate products uh, for them. Uh, so when we need separate products for people with disabilities, it's often in the form of assistive technology. 
uh, an add-on to existing uh, technology. So I really like this, uh, this uh, quote here from a Vietnamese Buddhist monk because I think he was thinking, he, thinking of um, uh, universal design uh, and teaching. So when you plant lettuce, if it does not grow well, you don't blame the lettuce. You look for reasons it's not doing well, maybe the fertilizer or more water or less sun and so forth. And so when you're designing a course and then um, you have a student in your course that, that's facing some challenges, rather than immediately think, oh, they're not trying hard enough, they're not doing things a certain way, they don't have the technical skills that they need and so forth, at least pause and ask yourself if you might have designed the course a little differently so that it would work for that student without lowering the standards in the course. So as the more we build in universal design, then the fewer accommodations students should need. Um, and um, I actually teach some online courses and that's definitely the same. I there it's kind of rare having a need for accommodations. And I've had students in my classes that are who are blind or deaf, have all sorts of mobility impairments, learning disabilities, attention deficits, and so forth. And so we can reduce the number of accommodations. So the, the image on the left shows a large circle with accommodations in it as a part of universal design, because I consider the accommodations as part of the design. But on the right, if you're really employing universal design uh, to the max, then that the number of things in accommodation category uh, will diminish a great deal. So that's what we're shooting for. You can probably get them, you won't eliminate them totally, but you can uh, get them down to fewer. So uh, one perfect example of um, a universal design feature that has been uh, fully embraced uh, by our society and many others is, is uh, curb cuts. Uh, this is an image on our front page of our uh, newspaper here at the University of Washington, our student newspaper called The Daily. Um, and it's a, a man in a wheelchair it says ramp the curbs, get me off the street. Uh, and so there weren't ramp curbs back there in 1970. And this person was just having to go up and down the streets. Um, and I'm sure there are many people at our university that thought uh, this is never gonna happen with all the hills uh, at the University of Washington and Seattle in general. Well, it has happened, it has been um, embraced. And uh, when you create a new side lot walk, it's not that difficult to put a curb cut in it. Uh, but going back and retrofitting all those old sidewalk, sidewalks was quite a chore. And so we're kind of hoping something will happen, a paradigm shift within um, other applications. And to uh, kind of make the point between ADA, ADA compliance, as people call it sometimes, and uh, universal design, let's look at an entrance to a building here at the University of Washington, where you have a two-step entrance to the main door, and then you have a ramp to the left. It looks uh, pretty shallow. and and has handrails and probably is ADA compliant, but it's not fully universally designed because people enter the different the um, building in different ways. On the right, there's an image that shows a, a similar entrance to a building at the University of Washington, except in this case, the entrance, the primary entrance is really wide um, and it's a ramp, but also again, very shallow. And so if you were walking side by side with a person using a wheelchair or a walker uh, in image number one, you'd part ways to get in the building where in image number two, you'd go in together. And there are stairs in this particular building. And so if you wanna use stairs, you can, but the idea is that the primary entrance is the one that's most uh, inclusive, it's most um, accessible to everybody and doesn't segregate people. The basic idea with IT is to build in accessibility features and then ensure the compatibility with assistive technology somebody might be using. So we minimize the, assistive technology and the need for it by building in things like changing the color of your characters next to the uh, background, um, you know, having speech outputs and, and other uh, things to make things more accessible. We just need to look no further than our smartphones to see about these accessibility features that used to be just things that they, things that they uh, had in assistive technology for people with disabilities. And another point is if you design something to be universally designed, including IT, it usually benefits other people as well. And uh, so if we just take a look at a simple one in captioning videos, often we think of that for students who are deaf. Um, and so if you're unable to hear the audio, then yes, you need captions, but many other people benefit, like those who are English language learners, uh, those, those in a noisy environment like the airport or a noiseless one like the library uh, or a bedroom with the baby sleeping. 
Um, and those who might have a slow internet connection and so want to turn off the, the, the video. Um, and those who need to find content quickly um, so they can search, search for those content. It makes it possible uh, to search for content of the captions. So uh, I think it's important for faculty then to basically consider the characteristics of students who might be in their courses. Um, and then the assistive technologies that they might be using. Sometimes faculty will say to me, well, I, I'm going to create a survey and I'm going to survey, survey them on the first um, day of class and see what their needs are. <clears throat> That's not the, the process for universal design. The first step of universal design is just imagine they're going to have a broad range of characteristics. And then I'm not saying you shouldn't survey the students, but that that isn't the most important part. You should be prepared for a student uh, with any type of disability. Uh, and it's probably not going to be 100%, but you can get a lot farther than if you haven't thought about it as all, at all. <clears throat> what I do when I'm designing an online class is I think about uh, some of the students that I know. And we in the DOIT program, we have a lot of uh, students with disabilities and then uh, at the university as well. Um, and so that's easy to do. I know these uh, four people. Uh, but if you've even thought of these four people, and you designed your course accessible to them, then it's going to be accessible to a lot of students with disabilities. Maybe not everyone, but it will take you uh, a long way toward a fully accessible class and inclusive class as well. And so the images I have here, Anthony, who uh, doesn't have full use of his hands and uh, it doesn't have a, have a usable voice. Uh, so he uses technology that he can uh, have an on-screen keyboard and press the keys with his hand um, but also he has a uh, speech output so that he can connect his uh, device to a phone. He actually does phone support for a company that uh, sells assistive technology. So he can provide phone support even though he can't, doesn't have a usable voice himself. And so uh, that's uh, pretty dramatic how technology has improved his life. And Jesse has multiple learning disabilities. Uh, and so she uses dictation software because she has a hard time getting her thoughts down on paper or even using a keyboard. But she also has a, a reading disability. And so it's difficult for her to read like her email and so forth. And so she uses um, uh, speech output as well, uh, text-to-speech software. So it reads the content to her. Uh, so he, keep in mind then that the computer is reading the content to her and then it's taking down her dictation. Um, so she does quite well with that combination. Then there's Adrian, he's deaf. And of course, he needs captions or other uh, text or images to um, be presented if there's anything audio. And then there's Nicole, who has a, a computer science degree now, and she's uh, totally blind, does programming. And for her, she needs speech output. She needs uh, the software available. She can convert text to, um, to Braille and print out on her Braille embosser and so forth. So kind of think about those a little bit. And as you go down your journey, you might want to learn more about the technology they use, but that's just the introduction. Uh, one piece of good news is even though there are thousands, literally thousands of assistive technologies that people might be using, um, you don't need to know the details about that unless you're going to make a career of, uh, you know, supporting uh, assistive technology uh, for people with disabilities. It's more important for you to have some basics about what the limitations are of that technology that somebody might be using. So this is just a simple high level. Uh, you know, just a couple examples. And so um, looking at the assistive technology on the left-hand side of the screen and what that means in design of IT uh, is up here. So the assistive technology may emulate the keyboard, uh, but not the mouse. So someone uh, with a, a physical mobility impairment like Anthony, um, the technology he's using, you could pretty much guarantee it will emulate all the functions that are on his keyboard, but not necessarily a mouse. And so what that means for web designers and software designers is that they need to make the uh, product um, operate with the keyboard alone. And so things like, just think of something you might use your mouse for to go and make a selection somewhere on the screen. So perhaps they, a person can use the arrow keys to get to that spot. Um, so it needs, you need designers that will uh, build in uh, these, these types of features so they don't just block people with disabilities out. Uh, the uh, screen screen readers um, can read the content presented. It cannot read the content presented in images. Uh, so we have features uh, to provide alternative text, uh, and that screen reader will pick up that text and read it to the person uh, if they I, they so they are using a screen reader. 
And so this could be a student who's blind, for instance. I'd like to bring this up because probably in your learning management system, and here we use Canvas, it will prompt you for alternative text, uh, but that you or faculty you work with may not understand why, uh, and that's why. Um, so that would be an example too. Some faculty might think, well, if I have a student who's blind in my past, then I'll go back and change all that. Well, it's much easier just to do it as you're putting uh, images up on your pages in your learning management system. Uh, assistive technology, uh, specifically screen readers, can tab from link to link on a web page. Uh, you might wonder why that matters. Uh, well, if a person is using a screen reader, perhaps because they're blind, uh, they would like to see an overview of the web page many times. Uh, like those of us who have sight would just look, kind of scan the page and think, oh no, I, I don't want to go to these resources, resources. I better look somewhere else. So if you make the, um, the text on uh, links, uh, the same for each one and it might look orderly for you and so all the links say click here click here click here that's exactly what the person in their screen reader is going to hear uh, when they access that web page and so what you are telling the student who's blind using the screen reader is oh you have to read this whole page and then you can kind of figure out which words are clustered around that that uh, link that hyperlink uh, and so that really is time consuming so uh, there are uh, another feature of screen readers is that it can skip from heading to heading within the document itself, uh, like the PDF document or the Word document or uh, or whatever. Uh, and so, and then why would you need that? Well, if you're a screen reader user, you might need it because you want to know how the paper is organized. It might be a 25 page paper, uh, and it might be good to to read the headings, and they'll be they should be hierarchical. So you'll see heading one, uh, heading two, heading two. Heading three, heading three, heading two. And so you can see how the paper is organized. Um, otherwise, if you just take text and, and say you want to have a heading, you just select the text and make it bold, um, the screen reader isn't going to see that as a heading. And so that's really important too. Another thing that this isn't hard to do, it doesn't really even take more time to do it if you do it in the design process. And then we already talked about uh, the technology not able to uh, accurately describe audio. Um, and so then it's important uh, that you caption your video and transcribe audio. So it seems pretty simple. That's real, like I said, really high level. And uh, there are many technical people on my staff here that can give you a lot more detail, <laughs> but that's kind of the overview. So I often get asked by people, well, do I have to learn all these various technologies and so forth? Well, it's fun. It's, it's really interesting technology. You might want to learn to use a screen reader. But you may not be able to be proficient enough to really tell if a website is accessible using that unless you invest some time in it. Um, so you might think of, well, what, you know, what are going to be the limitations that I can actually uh, see? And like the, for the, um, you know, whether your website can be used without a mouse, just put your mouse aside and see if uh, you get to everything. <laughs> and then you'll have a, a, a simulation of what it's like for a person using a screen reader who happens to be blind. Uh, there are a lot of universal design principles, and you can thank me very much. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, but to cover all aspects of higher education, I, I like to point to three sets. Uh, the definition of universal design we already talked about, and uh, the original people that created that definition also developed seven principles of universal design that can be applied, applied to anything, a physical environment, technology, teaching, anything that we're doing uh, can, can use those principles as guidelines. But there are three that were added uh, quite a bit later um, by CAST um, and uh, organization. Uh, they came up with three universal design for learning principles. And they're particularly suited uh, to the learning environment. So particularly with online learning, um, they would be um, worth looking at. Um, and then I also like to include the principles that underpin the web content accessibility guidelines. There are four of them. Uh, because sometimes what people will do, they only use one set and they might be designing online learning and all they do is UDL uh, and not deal with accessibility. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I consider accessibility part of uh, universal design. Uh, so learning all three sets uh, can be a good way to start. However, we have short time today and you, you might be happy to know you don't really have to memorize all those. Uh, if you look at our website, which I'll give you the URL uh, for Universal Set, the Center for Universal Design and Education, you can find out what they are and see specific examples. But here's uh, kind of a rule of thumb. Uh, in a nutshell, 
uh, if you did these three things, your course is going to be pretty accessible and inclusive and usable. So number one, provide multiple ways for participants to learn and to demonstrate what they have learned. Uh, so teaching a concept using a short video uh, and then maybe having a, a, a handout or a website or something where they can also get that same content um, as a reinforcement or you can do um, uh, one or the other uh, if the content is basically the same. And then the second one is to provide multiple ways to engage. Uh, this can be helpful like uh, in, a, in a course you're teaching online in preparing for you know, students in your class uh, by applying universal design. Uh, communication systems and the way to engage, some are more accessible than others. So one thing I do in my syllabus is I always say, you can meet one-on-one, -on -one, uh, just make an appointment with me, send me an email at such and such. And then I say, and we can meet with, with Zoom or the bulletin board system, uh, part of the learning management system or email um, or anything else you choose. And so the idea is I give them the choice. So I don't need to know whether um, Zoom is not very accessible to somebody in my class. They get to decide that. Um, and so, uh, and also I don't have to use a technology that some students might be uncomfortable with. There might be people that don't wanna be on a Zoom, a Zoom call. It might be because they're English language learners and they're a little embarrassed about their English skills. Uh, and would be more comfortable doing email so that they can do some spell checking and so forth. And so giving students control when possible is a good way to uh, apply universal design without learning a lot of details about how accessible one product is. So the second one uh, is multiple ways to engage. So that's that second one. If you take a look at the first and second one combined, uh, those are just basically the three principles of universal design for learning just stated a little differently. And then uh, the third one is the one that gets uh, into um, more of the general principles of universal design and the, the web content accessibility guidelines underpinned by universal design um, uh, principles. And so what it says, besides those first two things that was universal design for learning, um, ensure all technologies, facilities, services, resources, strategies are accessible to individuals with a wide variety of disabilities. So you ensure that accessibility beyond uh, some of these universal design uh, principles of the other, other two. So, so the rest of the time, I'm just gonna kind of scan through some uh, basic uh, practices. Um, I developed a checklist um, with 20 tips. And the whole idea was I was hearing from so many faculty members I talked to, they don't even know where to get started. And they also got the idea that everything's really hard uh, because maybe the first thing they learned is how to, how to redesign an inaccessible PDF. And it's like, I don't have time to do all this stuff. And um, so, uh, so I decided to create a checklist. Uh, and Terrell Thompson on my staff, he had a 30 tips on how to design an accessible website. So I thought I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat him by having a fewer, fewer on my list. Well, not really, but it's a good story. So uh, this is available online. Um, the URL is, is on the screen here, but you also, these days I can search for 20 tips as 20 as a number, uh, just with a Google, tour, Google search. And often this handout comes up uh, number one, or at least one of the first items, uh, because it's used by a lot of people and you can feel welcome to, uh, to link to it um, as well. It's not the, you know, it's been developed and, and it's been edited over many years. Uh, and uh, so it's not a perfect list and I can always think of more things to put on there and I do uh, adjustments as people give me additional ideas. Uh, nine tips are about the technology, essentially how it's designed, uh, how accessible it is. Um, and then 11 for the instructional methods. So that's more the pedagogy, um, like the universal design for learning type things and good design practices. Um, and uh, the difference between that handout and um, what you see on the screen today is that there are links to resources for doing the things that I'm talking about, like where to get started to look at how to make a PDF document accessible, for instance. So you, you need to look at the, the online document to get those, uh, those places to go to if you wanna learn more about any of the, these particular things. So they were developed with a literature review, um, reports from online instructors. We have a lot of capacity building institutes and other programs where we hear from people. Uh, what they're doing, what works, what doesn't, but also students. 
Uh, and one little sidelight is students with disabilities, when we put them on a panel and have them talk about uh, how accessible online learning is to them, the things that they bring up often are things that any student would say. And I'll point out a few things as I go through this list. Uh, they don't, there's not really high level technical details. And now you have to have a certain level of access uh, to even get that kind of feedback. Um, but a lot of the stuff, as you see, is not uh, rocket science. Uh, and so the message is that you can do some accessibility things and inclusive things uh, without uh, a broad uh, background in uh, IT accessibility. So when we're looking at web pages or documents or images, or videos even, here are a few things. Um, for layouts and organization, uh, this is often present, prevent, presented as a problem for students with disabilities. Now, having worked recently, a lot recently, with faculty members that are throwing everything <laughs> that they do in person online uh, because of the pandemic, um, you can look at those courses and you'll see a great deal of inconsistency in the layouts and organization schemes. And I have a lot of forgiveness for these faculty members, by the way. So maybe the first iteration, uh, that's okay. But then they should just go back and see if they can decide what their format is going to be and be consistent with it throughout uh, the course. That can be very helpful for students with some types of disabilities and sometimes when it affects executive functioning uh, and so forth. And it will benefit other students as well. I think we would all agree. Use text format. Uh, don't put in a scanned in PDF. It's just an image um, because it can't be read uh, directly by a screen reader. And then uh, with that text, also structure the headings. I already talked about that using the heading structure that is in the, the uh, package you're using. It could be a learning management system or Word or, or other, other package. You can look and see what the accessibility features and see if there's something like that. Uh, and lists as well. You know, you might, uh, I think most people use the style uh, function within word uh, to create their list, but I still run into documents where that's not the case and they just uh, put a, you know, manually put in a, a dot in front of the items. Then what happens if someone reads it um, uh, some, with a screen reader, it doesn't distinguish those items as lists. Um, and so it just may come across as just a flow of ideas. Uh, and the list structure, uh, as we know, if we do have sight, it benefits us, it help us organize our thoughts. Uh, and so that's why you need to do that as well. And the third is descriptive wording for hyperlinks, also for screen reader users. Uh, guidelines in doing that. Um, I like to uh, keep it really short and specific. Uh, it doesn't have to be a really long one. Um, and there are actually guidelines. You can search around the internet and find some guidelines for that as well. Uh, I've already said I would uh, avoid using PDFs unless you want to in invest some time. Uh, that's okay. Uh, some people, they insist on having a PDF. Uh, we're working with a, a center uh, now for the last couple of years, and it was an inaccessible PDF. He didn't really want to um, learn how to make it accessible. He just wanted to use it that way. So they send these out with, using email and then put them on their website. And so, so his solution was just to have an accessible Word document, but also have the PDF. Um, and that's maybe not the best solution, but it's it's a good one. Uh, if you look at the Do It website, we have a lot of uh, dis, uh, handouts that people can usually print and pass out in, the, in their own sessions, not so much now. Um, but and I like to have PDF for that because it, it's easier, to, it looks good when it's printed. Uh, but then we have an HTML version, which is easier to make um, accessible and it's more accessible um, on, in the grand scale. And so we uh, use it, we have an HTML copy as well. We just have two versions. Uh, but the thing that's unique about our uh, program, maybe not totally unique, but and there aren't a lot of programs that do it that I run into anyway, is the, the one that's the default one is the HTML version. And so you have to click on the PDF uh, link to get the PDF copy. Most of the websites I see, they do it the other way around and say, well, here's this nice, beautiful PDF. If you want an accessible form, click here. Uh, so I, I really encourage people to have the, the most accessible thing that they have um, uh, featured, kind of like that uh, ramp going into that uh, building that I mentioned. So uh, that's uh, critically important with the primary content, but all content. 
is good. Some faculty will say, well, what about all these things I'm linking to? They're PDFs. And they look a little closer and realize that they're, they're images because they can kind of try to select the text and it's just one big image. And what I tell them if they're just getting started is, is um, well, first of all, search, search around the internet. You might be able to find an accessible version or your librarian might help you do that. And so that's a, a good thing to do. Um, but you also might have to just wait and that will be uh, considered an accommodation, but you're at least aware of it and you're at least not adding more inaccessible PDFs to the world. And include text descriptions of content and images. I already talked about that. That's another one you can find some good, um, good guidelines out on the internet. And there's a link uh, to one or two in that document itself, the 20 tips. Um, and there are also uh, you know, really specific guidelines on particularly large complicated graphs, like in science areas and so forth, and uh, large comp uh, uh, complicated tables. Uh, one particular guideline is to just keep those images and the table as simple as you can in structure. And so you might uh, divide that table into several parts um, and make it more linearized so there aren't so many uh, sub areas and sub areas and sub areas. Um, so, um, but uh, those, those long, uh, those, those complicated images that do take some, some work. The simpler ones, I like to tell people just you know, use your own common sense because you know the content yourself um, and uh, just make it descriptive. And you don't have to tell uh, about everything. You might've noticed in that when the red coffee pot was on the screen, I just kind of slipped in that the, the handle and the spout were on the same side. The reason I did that is I'm not assuming that everyone can see the screen. Uh, could be because of a disability, might be that you don't want to have the screen on because you have a slow internet connection. Who knows? Who knows? But I, I just assume that there might be people watching this uh, that are um, that are that are not accessing the image. Uh, one way to think about that is imagine somebody's calling in. Uh, so how are you going to describe that without a really great deal of detail so they understand what the point you're trying to make? And so with the coffee pot, even though I really like the red color and other qualities of it, I don't bother to describe all that, but I do give the, the distinguishing characteristics uh, that make it an interesting example. So web pages, documents, images, and videos, page two of two. Large, bold, sans serif fonts, uncluttered pages, plain backgrounds. I'm demonstrating that today. Uh, you might make exceptions on that, but for people with visual impairments and some learning disabilities, it can be very difficult to read if there's a busy background. Uh, so uh, maybe make your PowerPoints not quite as pretty as you'd like to, to benefit many people. Uh, use high contrast color combinations and avoid uh, problematic ones for those who are colorblind. Um, that's something you could easily ex explore and there's a link on the 20 tips handout. Um, I'm told um, that green and red are particularly difficult for many people with, um, with uh, colorblindness, but um, but my practice is to always make sure that the color, under, seeing the color is just an option. Uh, and so you might have a, a couple buttons on the screen and uh, you might want people to choose one. If they're all, if they're all triangular in shape, um, then you say, when you say one, well, choose the red one for this and the blue one for that, um, then a person who's colorblind not, may not be able to follow uh, what you want them to do. Uh, but if you made each one a different shape and a different color, then you can say, you know, choose the blue triangle or the, the red circle or, or what. And then you don't, you, it's, again, you don't have to know whether it's a problem for anybody. You've just anticipated that it might be sometime. Make sure videos are captioned and audio description is good too. That's not done as often, but it uh, it's, gives a little extra uh, audio where uh, the, the reader reads something aloud, like maybe the, the title of your video or the credits at the end. Um, I encourage people creating their own videos to try to speak all the content. Uh, so a person, a student, for instance, can get all the content by listening to what you're saying um, and uh, including the credits at the end, uh, the acknowledgement, you might have something like our, our videos that says, for more information on this topic, consult, well, just speak that. And so if a, you don't have the audio, extra audio description in there, at least uh, a student uh, would be able to hear that. And uh, as much as we all love to have all kinds of technology tools, the greatest this and that, 
um, I recommend that you avoid using a large number of them uh, and uh, stick to the, the learning management system tools. Uh, for one thing, the students will get used to those tools and be uh, better at using them. And then also when you're using things away from the LMS, um, uh, make sure that they're accessible. Uh, like for instance, can you use them without the keyboard alone? Uh, and that might take some consultant, consulting to do that, um, but it's good to check. These last, there are actually some lists uh, out on the internet where you can just post a message to the discussion list and say, hey, I don't need to check the accessibility of whatever you're thinking about using. Um, Athen, A-T-H-E-N, all caps, uh, is a, an organization that has a discussion list and it's highly technical people regarding accessibility. And so you, we often see messages out there when people ask that question. Address a wide range of tech skills uh, and uh, pointing to resources. Uh, when I teach online, I, I assume uh, that there might be some in my class who's never used Blackboard or Canvas or whatever I'm teaching the course in. And so I know there, there are a lot of uh, user documents that can help them do that, but I also know there are tons of documents and videos. And so what I do is say at the beginning of the course, if you haven't used uh, this learning management system, I suggest that you start with these three resources and point them to them because you alone know which ones are gonna be needed, especially the first couple of weeks of the class. And then make sure that the content's presented in different ways. We talked about that as UDL, uh, multiple ways to communicate and collaborate, another UDL principle, and multiple ways to demonstrate your learning. Uh, so giving, giving students choices, or if not choices, at least different ways. Uh, so all of your tests are not exactly the same format and so forth. So, so some students uh, that aren't so good at one way uh, to show they've learned something might be better at others. Um, be sure to address a range of language skills, just using plain English. Uh, one of the biggest complaints I get from students with disabilities, but I think of the other students as well, is faculty members that don't spell out or define acronyms and jargon. Uh, even jargon that you might consider that everybody knows, uh, like one, I always do, I only use the expression low hanging fruit a lot, particularly when it comes to accessible design. Um, and uh, the first time I use it in the class where I, I might be teaching, I always define it and I just build it in. I just say, if you haven't heard that expression before, what I mean by low hanging fruit is whatever. Make sure the instructions and expectations are clear. Um, I like to put all my instructions and my assignments in great detail in the syllabus because then you're allowing the student, student to plan their time. So if they're gonna need extra time on something, they can do it uh, early on rather than later. They can get started right on day one and some of those things. Uh, make sure examples and uh, assignments are relevant to a diverse audience. Uh, think up some clever different ways of saying things. Providing outlines or notes or other scaffolding tools. Uh, so that students maybe that are a little weak on study skills might be able to learn something from you um, in the early days of the class. And I like the word scaffolding because that implies then the scaffolding is gonna come down. So it's just a crutch to get started. Make sure there are adequate opportunities to practice. Uh, in some cases, um, I used to teach mathematics, but uh, not online actually, but uh, uh, you know, some students just need a lot more practice. And so you can easily build in extra practice by uh, you know, giving an assignment for the whole class and then saying, if you feel that you need extra practice with this, uh, here's, here's another, you make that an optional activity. And you might think, well, students aren't gonna make that choice. Some will, uh, and that gives them an, uh, an opportunity to own it, to own that they're gonna learn that concept. Yeah, we have one more. Feedback on parts of an assignment uh, and corrective opportunities. If a big project, if you can give uh, feedback, like. If, First, have the students say what they're thinking about doing for their project. Um, maybe even check in midstream to see how they're doing and, and give them further feedback. So now I have two other things I want to mention and I'm not gonna go above 20 because I'm gonna lose the competition with Terrell. Um, but one thing I like to mention is using accessibility checkers in Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, in the learning management system and other products you might be using. Along with the accessibility checkers, often there are templates like uh, PowerPoint and the advantage of using an existing template and maybe modifying it somewhat, but is that those templates tend to be uh, designed in an accessible way and they will be pointing you toward 
um, accessible practices uh, rather than just create a lot of text box boxes and create your own design. And then when you're choosing IT tools to use, get some help from a consultant on whether they're accessible. accessible. Um, but you can do a few things, uh, short things, like uh, checking for the accessibility page on the website of the product. If they don't have an accessibility page, there's a real strong possibility they haven't thought about accessibility at all. Otherwise, they put their page and brag about it. Um, and uh, there's a, the um, voluntary product accessibility template used by the federal government and uh, software and hardware vendors need to fill it out in order to establish the federal government. You can look that up and see what they say. Keep in mind, it might be their marketing people that uh, created the VPAT and also the accessibility page on their website. So it's not a perfect uh, thing. Um, and then the question on the app and discussion list I mentioned, and there are some others as well and uh, see if you can operate the technology with the keyboard alone. So there's just a few ways to get started. Um, so uh, anyway, we're kind of at the uh, close to the end here. On our Do It website, I mentioned Do It early on, we actually have an extensive knowledge base because there's some specific things that you might find, you're not gonna find in these guidelines for getting started um, or even on more comprehensive um, websites. Um, but for example, STEM content. I haven't really talked about that. Some of this, everything applies to STEM content. We know there are a lot of symbols and things that may, may make it more difficult. Um, and so in our knowledge base, we have a lot of Q and A's. Uh, and so here's just a couple of them. Are there guidelines for creating accessible math? Yes. And how can I create math and science documents that are accessible to students with visual impairments? How do I create online math content that is accessible to students who are blind? And what are some techniques for creating braille math materials. Uh, and so you can really get into the technical details uh, once you do make the basic considerations that I'm talking about today. So this is just the beginning, but if you're training faculty, I would encourage you to use the 20 tips, um, but also to edit them for yourself. I mean, you, you may want to exchange um, some of the ideas with some others that you would, you would choose for your group. And you'll notice at the end of that handout that it says you have permission to even edit the document as long as you give credit to the source, which was do it in that case. So if we look at uh, universal design, it values diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it can be used for um, part of the framework for your DEI efforts, uh, those initiatives on all of our campuses these days uh, to make things more inclusive of, of multiple groups. Uh, it promotes best practices, does not lower standards. It's proactive and can be implemented in incrementally, uh, benefits everybody, and minimi minimizes the need for accommodations. Uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of uh, the summary and the real super short summary is, this is all just good teaching. I was a middle school and high school teacher early on taught math, uh, later some computer science, but um, a lot of these things, some of the practices you learn in uh, teaching and development classes. Uh, but not all, all of our faculty um, have had those classes, but these are just simply good practices of teaching. I think of captioning that way. It's a good teaching practice, um, but it also is a good, it's a necessary accommodation in some cases. Um, so um, resources, I uh, mentioned, uh, you know, my email address at the beginning, but I have that up here as well. Uh, Cheryl B at uw.edu, that's Cheryl with an S. The Center for Universal Design and Education at uw.edu slash doit slash cude, but you can just uh, search for the Center on Universal Design and Education and you'll find it. Um, accessible DL, that's another one, Access DL actually, all one word. Uh, that's a website on specifically with the 20 tips, but also um, many more resources, not just our own, many the other resources uh, that you can use. Uh, to go down your journey, journey on accessible IT. And that's at uw.edu slash DOIT and then slash uh, access DL. And uh, so uh, then there's accessible technology. That's the UW group uh, that is managed by Terrell and his team keeps this website up to date, uw.edu slash accessibility. And we're proud to say it's actually a link off the homepage of the University of Washington. So that's very cool. It's the bottom of the page. Accessibility is the link. Oh, hot off the press, a new book uh, that was uh, created with a lot of uh, input from the Do It projects we've had, Creating Inclusive Learning Opportunities in Higher Education, a Universal Design Toolkit. Um, and 
you can get a 20% discount with code I-N-L-E-H-E. -E. Anyway, if you go to the Center on Universal Design and Education, you'll find it listed there. So, Gaby, do we have any questions? Yeah, we have a question that was uh, posted in chat. Sarah asks, do you have advice for when there are conflicting access needs between students or between student and instructor? Uh, can you give me an example? Uh, let's see, Sarah, are you still, looks like she's still on the call. Do you have an example that you can uh, share with us? Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, okay. So like in my class, I can't really use a computer mouse or keyboard and I needed to caption videos for a student who doesn't hear and I injured her myself. So there was like a clear access conflict there. Um, and it was a situation which I had to do something within 24 hours. And there was, so there wasn't an option for, you know, like getting help. Yeah, well, if you created them, uh, did the captioning before the course started or are the videos being created as the course is going on? So actually, so this is bigger, this is a bigger structural issue in that situation where like, I wasn't told until like three days before the course that this, there was a student who needed this accommodation. So it's a bigger structural issue. Um, yeah. But I'm thinking more so when you have the issue of like, if you had a blind student and a deaf student, um, yeah. you could have a conflict in right, the way you're delivering content and the way you're choosing to do things, right? If, if, the, if to be more visual versus more auditory. Often, yeah, often I think that first example might be uh, requesting an accommodation. It seems like a reasonable accommodation for you at your institution. That didn't help you at the moment, I know. Um, but often, if you apply universal design, it's one, I, one way I like, the reason I like that model is because if you follow um, the practices, uh, you, you don't re run into conflicts as much. Um, and then sometimes you have to compromise. Uh, I, I, I think of an on-site example when a student is using a sign language interpreter and another student has an attention deficit. Uh, that can be really disruptive to the student who has an attention deficit. Uh, and I would do the same thing online, but um, I would work it out uh, between the two people and or myself in that case and see how we can make it happen. Uh, so uh, uh, providing options often helps. Uh, I have an assignment in a class I'm teaching on universal design where I have people go out to the internet, find an image of a physical space um, that appears to have a universal design feature that's not labeled as such um, and take it, in, uh, attach it to a, a message in the discussion board uh, and then explain to the group why you considered that to be a universal design feature. But right into the assignment, I say, um, alternatively, uh, you can describe a physical space you have had experience in where some feature of that site, uh, physical space, you would count as universal design, uh, then um, explain that to the group. Um, but also the people that use images then, they have to describe those images. Uh, so a person can respond, but. Uh, respond who might be blind. Anyway, the, the assignment, you think of a very visual thing and it would be hard to make it accessible. It's not really that hard if you give people options. Now I've had quite a number of people use the describe uh, physical environment you've been in. And uh, to my knowledge, they're not blind. And so that's a plus too, I think with universal design, but anybody can do it. I just make an option, you can decide and you don't have to tell anybody why. Okay, that is uh, all of the questions that we have in the chat. So um, we are uh, at the end of our time period too. Um, I will stay on and some people on my staff will stay for a little while here. And so if you have a question, uh, maybe something was beyond the scope of this talk, um, we can uh, keep chatting here, but uh, thanks for coming and, uh, uh, and uh, you can leave now if you want or hang out with us for a few minutes.